Hey there, Starshots. Trace here, episode five of five on Leaving Earth starts right now. So far, we've talked about going to Mars, going to the moon, and living on those two places. And we've had experts like Pascal and Ariel, and it's been awesome. We've talked about how to get off the planet and why we should even go, and we know we gotta go. So should we hit up Mars? Probably not for a while, like 30 years. Should we hit up the moon? We can. More on that in the previous episode. But what about exoplanets? What about space stations? Where else could we live? In January 2020, very recently, NASA found another habitable exoplanet, TOI 700D. It could have liquid water on it. It's about 100 light years away. There's no solar flares from its star that would kill everything on the planet. And we don't know yet if there is an atmosphere, but we know it's out there. In 2017, we found the TRAPPIST-1 system. It has seven planets. Three of those could be potentially habitable, and a couple of them could be awesome, could be perfect. They would look like moons in each other's skies because they're so close together. There's possibly water on the surface. They're rocky, they have atmospheres, and they're only 40 light years away. That's just so close. That's so cool. But of course, you know, not too cool. It's more icy, you know, just warm enough for water and stuff, so it's like, not cool, it's great. So let's go, right, Humies, right? Y'all, obviously I think space is incredible. It's so, so, so big. But if we wanna leave our solar system, we're gonna need to do some stuff. We're gonna need to do some work. We need to learn to live and die in space. And right now, conservatively estimating, there are maybe a dozen Earth-sized habitable planets out there that we know of. Four of them are in the TRAPPIST-1 system, about 39 light years away. One of those is Earth-sized and similarly warm, potentially. But 40 light years, that's actually, I mean, it sounds close, but that's freaking far. Even at 20% light speed, it would take us 20 years to get to Proxima b. That is the closest star system to us in the planet in that star system. It would take us 200 years to get to TRAPPIST-1. 200 years, that's generations of humans on a single ship. We need to learn to live and die. And there are people thinking about this already. I know, isn't that amazing? There are people who this is what they think about all day, every day. People like Whether May the design Johnson. becomes very complicated or whether the design needs to be simplistic. It's about sustainable agriculture. It's about manufacturing breakthroughs, understanding how to build things differently. It's about being able to communicate. It's about financial innovation and methodologies. It's about human health. So it really spans the breadth and the width of human experience. First, for long-term space travel, we need to take care of our bodies and our minds. A really easy way to do it is to create gravity. Without gravity, in microgravity, astronauts on the International Space Station and elsewhere for long periods have eyeball problems, they have bone loss, they've got muscle loss. And sure, Scott Kelly was a little taller when he came back from space, but then he got shorter again once gravity compacted his spine back down. Even with exercise, we cannot stave off all of our issues. Luckily for us, people like Arthur C. Clarke and other nerds were out there thinking about how we can do this. And the concept of a fully built human technological win came up. A free floating space station spinning to create gravity, just like we would have here on Earth. We still don't know, of course, how to do this. <laughs> Spinning a spacecraft is easy. Anybody can spin a spacecraft. That doesn't take much effort at all. And when you do that, the forces would pull toward the outside of the spacecraft or toward the floor if the circle is big enough. The problem is if that cylinder that you're in space in is too small, your head is gonna feel different gravity than your feet. And the inner ear does not like that feeling. On top of that, spinning is not great for balance. If you turn your head while you're spinning, then the whole body just has, there's problems, okay? It's called the cross-coupled illusion. You get sickness, there are issues with the inner ear, and we haven't figured out how how to fix it. In studies from 2019, they spun people very slowly and then over time sped it up, up to about 17 revolutions per minute. And when they did that, they adapted to the spinning. So we don't have a spinning spacecraft yet that can create gravity to go to another star or even to go to places like Mars. That doesn't mean that people aren't thinking about ways to get us there, even if we don't send humans. For example, the Breakthrough Starshot. It's a proof of concept for ultra-fast light-driven nanocrafts. They wanna launch to Alpha Centauri very soon, and it'll take 20 years to get there. So if they launch today, they'll get there in 2040. Proxima b is the local habitable planet in Alpha Centauri's system, and we get pics of that Hattie, which would be sweet, and they would send them back to us. At light speed, it'll take a lot less time, only like four years for it to get back to us. 
The thing is, we're not sending humans, we're sending nanocraft. What's a nanocraft? I'm glad you asked. It's a miniature space probe. It's about the size of a postage stamp and it uses teeny tiny electronics and a teeny tiny camera so they can take pictures and send back data. It's pulled by a light sail at speeds of up to 100 million miles an hour. Still would take a long time to get there, of course. And a light sail, I'm glad you asked on that one as well, is a super thin material. It uses a laser to push the sail like an ancient ship used wind, but it's not gonna work yet. The thing is, uh, it's not us going anywhere. I mean, it's the royal us, we humans are sending our stuff, but it's sort of like a, sending a disposable camera to another star system. Not as exciting as sending even a probe that has little wheels on it, right? Or people. And there are people working on sending people. 100 Year Starship wants to learn how to launch a starship with humans on it within 100 years to another star system. Within a century might seem like kind of far from now, but it's actually not because there are a lot of things to consider. Propulsion, economics, government. Who's gonna live? Who's gonna die? How are they gonna do those things? How are they gonna deal with waste? How are they gonna grow food? How are they gonna have oxygen? How are they gonna have water? The nice thing is, a spaceship, if thought of properly, is not unlike a planet. This planet doesn't get more water. It just recycles the water it has. The water that you drink at home, this cup of water, you know, the water here was running through some dinosaur's urinary tract at some point. Got my eye, delicious. So if they can figure out how this works, if they can figure out how to create a self-contained system with everything we need, we could conceivably go to another star. I emailed them to talk to them for this story, but they're a little busy right now. They didn't respond to my emails, but they are still tweeting as of May of 2020, so they still do exist in some capacity, and there are still people thinking about it. But if we go anywhere, Mars, the moon, an asteroid, who goes? What kind of jobs do they do? If they raise kids, what jobs do they do? This is a closed system, remember? So it's not like we can invent new jobs unless we make room for them in the closed system. And if I have a kid, does my kid have to do the same job that I did? Because there's only so many people, there's only so many jobs, there's only so many places people can go. Not everyone can be a miner or an engineer, just like not everyone can be an artist or a musician. But there comes a point where it gets really complicated because just like here on Earth, not everyone can be an astronaut when they grow up. We need people to make food. We need people to clean up after each other. We need people to pilot the ship. And what about genetic diversity? We need people who don't have genetic disorders that can't be treated, but we also wanna make sure that we have enough people of differing backgrounds and diversities that we're gonna be all of humanity. We need farmers, but robots can do the farming too. And which is better, sending a bunch of engineers that know how to build and fix robots or send a bunch of farmers who know how to grow crops? Of course, we won't have pesticides because we won't have pests. We have picked the plants specifically and there's not gonna be insects with them unless we need them and no plant diseases because we'll have looked at the genetics and determined which plants to send. Should we take pets? Should we take children with us to start? How does government work in a world that is completely separated from ours? The 100 Year Starship looks at all of this. I put a couple videos down in the description. Mae Jemison is the head of the 100 Year Starship. It's amazing stuff. But to paraphrase poet Young MC, what we're really doing here? We're looking for love in all the right spaces, no dead worlds, just water places. But what about how? How is a great question. How could we get there? We could cryo-freeze ourselves. Studies have yet to replicate cryo-freezing in humans, but we have frozen and rewarmed some smaller organisms and plants and embryos and little groups of cells. The big problem here is that ice crystals form within our cells and destroy the structures in there. Water, which makes up most of our cells, expands when frozen. You can see this if, say, you were to put a water bottle that was completely full in your freezer and close it. It will stretch the water bottle. If it's too full, it could burst it. And that's what would happen to our cells as well. And we still haven't figured out this problem because it's a chemical property of water. But if we think outside the brain box, there are other ways to send humans to other stars. For example, brain projection. Seriously, this is a thing that people have thought of. Michio Kaku and other philosopher physicists have mentioned that we know now the human genome. We know now how to map the human connectome, which is all of the little teeny connections inside of our brains. A connectome is a map of every connection in every way inside of our brain. Every fiber, every bit, everything that is you is your connectome. Theoretically, if we can map it well, we could make an exact copy of your connectome in a computer program and project it. Now, it may not seem as exciting as putting your feet on the ground, but technically that connectome is you. It's almost like a picture of you, 
that could walk out of the frame and become another version. If we can do something like a connectome, we can turn it into a computer program and beam it to another star, we can put humans on other planets. You didn't think this is where we were going, did you? <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> we can send you to another star in a computer. If first we send a robot that gets there and gets all set up and is ready to download the connectome that we sent separately in a laser beam, it could then walk around on another planet and tell us what it was like. And I say it, but it would be you. You could walk around on another planet or another version of you. And it is not out of the realm of possibility. We just don't entirely know how to do it yet. And that might be a very efficient way to send humans to other planets. And that is the reality of all this. We think of ourselves as this crazy, powerful race that can do anything, filled with our own mojo and power and righteousness. But we're toddlers. We're children. We don't know anything about anything. We're still sniffing the cosmos like a cat deciding whether it should go out the door. We have no idea what's out there. We have no idea how to explore it. We have no idea what will happen when we do. And we're super curious about it, but terrified at every crack, every pop, every twig snap. That's exciting, isn't it? Earlier I mentioned that in 1883, Krakatoa in Indonesia erupted. And again, it exploded and it was terrible. And it took decades, but animals were able to repopulate. This is something that I think we can keep in mind. Not in the way of planet Earth being destroyed, but we can learn from those animals. They went to a place that was harsh. They went to a place that maybe could not have supported life when they got there. And 50 years after Krakatoa, after that island was completely destroyed of all life, hundreds of species thrived there. And they did it without technology, and they did it without breakthrough programs, and they did it without projecting lasers with brains on them to other planets. And we can do it too. Section 2.4.7 of the National Research Council's report on shared human destiny and aspiration says, and I quote, Human spaceflight aims to study humanity's future, to dare to discover how far humans can go, and to investigate what they have a chance to become. From space stations and starships to planetary outposts and terraforming, human imagination acts as a forecaster of a potential future to be reached only via continued development of humankind's capabilities for spaceflight. Isn't that awesome? Whew. We've reached the end here. Five episodes on leaving Earth. Can we do it today? Yeah. Can we go to Mars? Not quite. Not yet. Can we go to the moon? Absolutely. We just need to want to go. Can we go to another star? Soon, my friends. Soon. But probably not right now. Not with our bodies. Leaving Earth is inevitable. It's exciting. And it'll make humans into something different, something new. And we need those breakout technologies because they will help us here on the planet that we live on now. But we also need to do this. We need to look forward especially now, because we are in a period in our own history where we could destroy each other tomorrow. We could destroy each other in minutes, or we can make each other better over time. Space can do that for us, but it's not the space. It's the us. It's that collective effort, don't you think? I thank you very, very much for watching this series on leaving Earth. If you have ideas for future series, please let me know down in the comments. If you have people that you think I should talk to about stuff, put those down there too. I also left a link down there if you want to pitch me an idea, like you don't quite have an idea yet, but you have some links and some things you want to send me, there's a link in the description for that too. Thanks again for watching. I am Trace. Come find me on all the social medias. I'm all over the place. I'm even on TikTok now, although I've never posted anything. I don't really know what to do <laughs> with it yet, but I'm out there. Come join me. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider clicking that subscribe button and I will see you in the future.